Guanajuato, Mexico, there is a museum filled entirely with mummies. Mi nombre es Paloma Robles Lacayo y soy la directora del Museo de las Momias de Guanajuato. El Museo de las Momias de Guanajuato es un recinto sagrado que exhibe una colección de momias naturales. With 117 bodies in total, the museum has the largest collection of natural mummies in the world. The mummies are the well-preserved remains of people who died during a cholera outbreak in Mexico in the 1800s. The museum is a haunting and eerie experience for visitors, an opportunity to stare death in the face. Vienen a buscar esa experiencia íntima, ese encuentro místico con la muerte, que propicia la reflexión en torno a la intensidad de su propia vida y el sentido de la misma. Es importante que las personas no le tengan miedo a la muerte y al contrario, lo vean como un fenómeno natural, como una transición inevitable de su existencia, porque finalmente se van a encontrar con ella. There's the rulers, the reverb tank, the Ebo. A normal instrument, you're, you're playing it and you're expecting it to have a sound that is pleasing. But with an instrument like this, the goal is to just produce sounds that in this case are disturbing. The apprehension engine is an instrument that creates a variety of really creepy and some would say horrifying sounds. My name is Mark Corvin. I'm a film music composer and lately I've been focusing on horror movie scores. Two of my biggest hits as far as horror films are concerned was from the late 90s, a film called Cube and most recently, uh, The Witch. I originally commissioned the apprehension engine because I was tired of the same digital samples, which, which resulted in a lot of sameness of a lot of horror music. So I was looking for something more experimental, more acoustic, that would give me a little bit more of an original sound. That's where I contacted my friend, Tony Duggan-Smith. So Mark called me asking me to create a crazy instrument for horror films. Because I'd never done anything like that before, it made me empty out all my pockets and all my drawers of any knickknacks and bits and bobs I could possibly string together to make it happen for him. And this is what came of it. You're dealing with things that stir primal emotions and feelings. And there actually is a skill set that you have to acquire in order to, to get the most out of it. It expresses what really can't be expressed any other way. It's not music in the traditional sense at all. But let me put it this way. The apprehension engine definitely evokes an emotion. So I would call it music. Every night, countless people wake up, unable to move, their minds and bodies in the throes of a real condition called sleep paralysis. When triggered, the symptoms are usually mild from tense muscles to labored breathing. But for some, the experience conjures hallucinations that make nightmares come alive. Here are some of their stories. Uh, 
before I learned to cope with it, I've seen quite a few awful things. Horror films don't really, they don't really do anything for me anymore because what I've seen is more terrifying. The earliest I can remember is seeing a figure that looked like my mother sitting on my bed. Uh, her face is then morphing into some kind of uh, demon. Another time, a little girl was in the corner just, uh, just staring at me. Then without notice, she shrieks and runs up and grabs me by the neck. You, you try to call for help, but your voice, it, uh, it doesn't work and your body um, won't respond. You just, you just, you just feel helpless. On one particular night, I felt like someone was looking at me from the foot of my bed. I knew that nothing was there, but I was afraid to open my eyes. When I did, I saw a woman's head looking straight back at me. She didn't have a body or even a neck, just her head. I still remember the smirk she had on her face. I closed my eyes immediately and I was unable to move. When I felt it was safe, I opened my eyes again. She was still there and she began to laugh at me. I closed my eyes again, hoping she would disappear. Then I heard this scoff and she was gone. So I remember waking up and feeling a presence in the room and I see this woman in a black dress looming above the floor and she kept coming closer and closer to me. I could feel my throat closing and I, I couldn't breathe. As soon as she made it towards me, she floated right in front of my face and started screaming. I bolted out of my bed and I tried to wake up my parents. Little did I know I was still dreaming and I ended up back in my bed in another sleep paralysis experience. It's something that's so wild and surreal that there's no logic to it. So if you wake up one day paralyzed by horrific visions, remember to stay calm and understand that your nightmares are only as real as you make them. Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, California is one of the most haunted places in America. Winchester Mystery House is an incredibly unique Victorian mansion created by Sarah Winchester, heiress to the Winchester Repeating Arms fortune. Sarah Winchester had a series of unfortunate things happen to her, including the death of her husband and daughter. She was a spiritualist and visited a medium to try and understand why. The medium said, well, the gun that won the West, there's a lot of karma there, so head West and build a house to appease these spirits. She started construction in 1884, which didn't stop until the day she died. The house is a 160-room Victorian mansion with no master plan. There's a lot of strange attributes. There's 40 staircases, 40 fireplaces, four elevators. We have a number of staircases that lead right to the ceiling. Doors that open up into nothing, or it's just a wall. The house is known for its spirits who many people believe are the ghosts of people who worked at the house, or even Sarah herself. A lot of our guests and employees have had very strange things happen to them in this house. Sometimes it's just footsteps, or hearing a voice, a light that flickers, or sometimes it's an actual full physical manifestation. If we haven't solved the mysteries in 93 years, then I don't know if we ever will.
This sculpture garden, located in Japan, was primarily unknown to the world until 2016, when a photographer stumbled upon it. There are around 800 sculptures in this park, depicting a mix of Buddhist deities and what are believed to be replicas of real people. All were commissioned by a wealthy Japanese man named Mutsuo Furukawa. He is said to have paid 6 billion yen, around 60 million US dollars, to create this collection in 1989. There is a large statue of Furukawa, which stands overlooking the park. The people depicted are said to be his friends and family, but it is unclear if they had any knowledge of their stony replicas. They stand near a Japanese village, the name of which translates to the village where you can meet Buddhist statues. Although these lifelike statues stare with blank expressions, visitors say there is an unsettling feeling to this place and a concern that at night, these effigies aren't so still. I think like everybody, I'm interested in stories about ghosts or extraterrestrials. Some people would say, well, don't explain that. Don't explain that. I want to believe that. People call me a debunker. They say I'm trying to disprove. I'm raining on their parade. And you know what? I, I don't apologize at all for trying to find the truth. and Joe Nickel from the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. We've invited renowned skeptic Joe Nickel to meet Cora Lorenzo. This, this medieval superstition has got to go. And, and this is really just, just silly. Except I'm Joe Nickel, and I'm a paranormal investigator. I investigate everything from monsters, ghosts, aliens, psychics, for a science organization and the magazine Skeptical Inquirer. I knew at the age of eight that I was a detective, but I eventually became a stage magician. Oh my goodness. My models were Harry Houdini and other magicians who used their magic talents to expose trickery. And meanwhile, like everybody, I was curious about haunted houses and flying saucers, and I decided I wanted to do something like that. I've written about 40 books primarily on mysteries. A lot of cases were miracle claims or some kind of uh, religious claims, spontaneous human combustion, lake monster mysteries, crop circles, UFO sighting, chupacabras, ghosts, Bigfoot. What I'm trying to do is actually investigate looking for facts and clues. As you begin to put together a case file, you fill the file folder with what data you have, and then trying to find actually corroborative evidence so that I can try to explain what's happening, explain a UFO sighting. My explanations are often quite mundane. People report seeing these long-necked, multi-humped lake monsters. There are many things that can create the illusion of a lake monster, including two or three or four otters swimming in a line, which create the effect of one large creature. Bigfoot is a tall, hairy, bipedal creature. There is a creature that looks very much like Bigfoot, that is a black bear or a brown bear, standing, sniffing the air and walking about. People driving by an old mansion in the little community of Burt, New York, sometimes reported seeing a ghostly figure dressed in white. As it turns out, they had had a mannequin dressed in white in the window, and that was responsible for many of those sightings. I think part of me would like for there to be ghosts and for there to be extraterrestrials, but I've done this a long time, and I'm pretty sure that ghosts don't exist. Even the skeptics who like what I do, well, often their first reaction is, <clears throat> that's pretty obvious. Everything is obvious after it's been explained. <laughs>